My name is Christopher Adams, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute of English Studies, University of London. It's a pleasure to be here speaking to you today, and I'm honored to have been named the Malkin New Scholar. I wish to express my thanks to the Bibliographical Society of America, as well as to the donor who sponsored this award. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the London Arts and Humanities Partnership, which has provided funding for my PhD work. The mid 20th century witnessed a flourishing of illustrated dust jackets, what Martin Salisbury refers to as hand rendered pictorial illustrations dominated British book design from the 1920s until the emergence of photographic techniques in the later 1960s. Success in dust jacket illustration required a sensitive ability to translate the spirit of the text to a readership. Dust jacket illustrators, according to Claire Badaracco, were a bridge between the author's intention and the audience's reception belonging at once to the interpretive level of the book and to the market forces that led to the production of its meaning as an objective text. While a good jacket would not necessarily boost sales, a bad jacket would certainly harm them. But if the cover illustration was that bridge that spanned the author's intention and the audience's reception, how did dust jacket illustrations bridge the chasm between an audience's reception and a potentially problematic text? This is the situation that novels featuring homosexual, bisexual, and gender non-conforming characters faced in post-war Britain. These novels, referred to at the time as queer books, found themselves tightly regulated by a nexus of laws concerning obscenity and libel, and by post-war social and legal attitudes that policed and criminalized homosexual behavior. These regulations and their effects, a phenomenon in my research I term the publishing closet, impacted what authors were willing to write, what publishers were willing to publish, and what booksellers were willing to sell. In this short talk, I'll discuss dust jackets of queer novels as a key site for interrogating the anxiety that authors, publishers, and booksellers experienced in relationship to queer books. How did publishers negotiate this fundamental contradiction? If the purpose of the dust jacket is to publicize, to make known the contents of the book, to advertise, to catch the eye of the potential buyer, how can a dust jacket function when the contents of that book are queer and are thus subjected to societal and legal regulation? What contortions and distortions play out on the landscape of the dust jacket? What subjects were chosen for representation on the covers of queer texts? And how did these images reflect or obscure the text's intentions? In the next few minutes, I'll discuss queer novels from the post-war period, drawing on my PhD dissertation work in publisher's archives. I argue that publishers and authors purposefully distanced the design of the dust jacket from its queer contents, engaging in what Lisa Moore refers to more broadly in queer writing of the time period as the queer aesthetic of distanciation. This distancing effect manifested itself in various ways, but I'd like to focus on three. The heterosexualizing of images, the use of classical illusion, and when these strategies failed, through the complete erasure of any image altogether. One way to obscure a text's queer content was to promote an exaggerated heterosexual image on its cover. There are numerous examples I could give, but I'll focus on this one. It is August of 1956, and young author Francis King has just submitted the manuscript for his new book, The Man on the Rock. King himself is a queer man, as is his editor at the firm of Longman's, John Guest. But the subject of the novel causes concern in the firm. The Man on the Rock tells about a young Greek man named Spiro, who has a series of parasitic romantic relationships, including one with an older American man. Despite the reservations in the firm because of the book's queer content, Longman's decided to publish the novel. Production proceeded as normal with copies sent to the printers in spring of 1957. Everything came to a grinding halt, however, when Longman's received an ominous note from a reader employed by the Northumberland Press. The note, written in reptilian green ink, read, This book deals extensively with the subject of homosexuality. The theme is an integral part of the story and could not easily be edited out. Only the grosser homosexual and heterosexual passages have been marked. This book should certainly be read by a lawyer. Because English obscenity law could prosecute anyone who aided or abetted in publishing an obscene libel, Longman's had to take the printer's request seriously. Guest wrote to King to suggest the toning down of the text, but on the same day, he also corresponded with illustrator Robert Micklewright, who had sent through a draft design of the dust jacket. 
Guest comments to Micklewright, though on the surface innocuous, attest to the anxiety about the man on the rock. This is a most striking design, but I'm rather worried about the figure of the woman, which is so unobtrusive. She does actually play an important part in the story, and she should be somehow more of a participant in the scene, say, leaning on her elbow, looking at the boy. I don't know quite what to suggest, but, but though you have rightly made the man the figure of central interest, one hardly realizes from your drawing that there is a woman there at all, less still an interesting and beautiful woman. Could you make it rather more of a he and she picture with the emphasis on him? Perhaps Guest really did think that the cover felt unbalanced. But given that the title of the book is The Man on the Rock, it is curious he should ask the designer to make the woman more prominent. Also in question is the she of the illustration. The Man on the Rock features not one, but in fact, two important women characters. Both characters interact with Spiro on the beach, and it is unclear which woman Guest is referring to when he says that she does actually play an important part in the story. Unless, of course, her identity as a character is less important than her identity as a woman, and importantly, an interesting and beautiful woman. What in other contexts would have tinges of a misogynistic request for a more prominent because more beautiful woman on the cover, in this instance reveals guest desire to wrap the text in an appearance of heterosexuality, of the he and she, at the expense of the text's queer implications. This altering or heterosexualizing of its dust jacket had far reaching consequences for the man on the rock. While G. Thomas Tanzel and others have remarked about the uses of dust jackets other than as their function as coverings for books, little attention has been paid to their use as separate marketing material. Publishers regularly ordered far more dust jackets than the number of books printed. The initial print run of King's The Dark Glasses, for instance, was 7,500 books, but 8,200 dust jackets. While some of this overprinting accounted for wastage, these jackets were important tools for publishers, travelers, agents, and sales departments, stand-ins for the book prior to the appearance of proof, review, and other pre-publication copies, or as marketing material to overseas locations where dust jackets were cheaper to ship than actual books. For the Man on the Rock, dust jackets were an important part of the pre-publication sales strategy for its US edition. Longmans agreed to supply US publisher Pantheon with 1,500 bound volumes, with the imprint on the title page altered to reflect the US publication. But when Kurt Wolf wrote to request 20 copies of the dust jacket in order to display them at the Pantheon sales conference, Guest responded that he was unable to supply the jackets because the draft was, quote, not quite right, and that Micklewright was in the process of redesigning them. The printer's panic about the queer content of the man on the rock therefore had two direct impacts as expressed through its dust jacket. First, it caused the dust jacket designer to redraft the cover illustration, yet again purposefully obscuring any of the text's queer content. And secondly, it prevented the dust jacket from being employed in its function as a marketing device, thus limiting the effective sales potential of the book. No draft of Micklewright's design is extant in the Longman's publisher's files, but it does remain an interesting thought experiment. If the initial design had been left to stand, how would the man on the rock have been perceived? How would readers have reframed their expectations about Spiro, the protagonist, and his relationships with his lovers, male and female, in the novel? By making the cover image more of a he and she picture, what messages, conscious and unconscious, were transmitted about how to read the text? While well, the previous examples focus on the ways in which publishers and printers respond to queer anxieties, my next example explores how an author uses her dust jacket to position her work in public. In the mid-1950s, the already well-established author Mary Reynolds went through a literary crisis. Wanting to write about queer characters, as she had done in The Charioteer, uh, but wanting to do so in such a way that the characters were not burdened by contemporary social codes of behavior, Reynolds found a solution in moving her stories to the world of ancient Greece. In The Last of the Wine, she began an active process of positioning her novels as works of serious historical interest. But in so doing, a rift emerged. While the text became increasingly filled with queer characters and appealed to an ever-expanding global queer readership, Reynolds insisted that the physical appearance of the books themselves maintained an outward form of scholarly sobriety. This act of distantiation separated the book object from the text, emphasizing an outward historical accuracy um, at the expense of expressing the text's interior queer sensibilities. And yet, the reliance on classical Greek imagery, for those in the know, did 
convey masked queer meanings of Greek love and Greek friendship. Reynolds editor John Guest sent her this image of a dust jacket designed by the prolific Val Biro, who had done the jacket for the charioteer. No Man Sings was a novel about Sappho, and Guest thought Biro would be a good designer for The Last of the Wine. But Reynolds was mortified by this design. Short chitons for girls were an exclusively Spartan fashion, worn nowhere else and much mocked by other Greeks. Lesbos is an, is an, is an Ionian island. In any case, the Spartan chiton was nothing like this. One breast appears to be bare, which is absolutely fantastic. Women of gentle birth did not go about barefoot in Greece unless possibly in Sparta. The outline of the girl's leg is an affected modern pose, which you wouldn't find in Greek art if you searched 500 years of it. Reynolds continued, I want the last of the wine to be read by people who also care about authenticity. I don't think there is any future in aiming a jacket at a different public from the book itself. Those who are put off by, by an authentic looking design will be put off by the contents, which they will certainly dip into before buying, whereas the reader already interested in Greece, with even a superficial knowledge of classical things, will take one look at a ward or street picture like this and just walk past. So having consciously chosen to set the story in ancient Greece for the stated purpose of allowing her queer characters a freedom uninhibited by mid 20th century social convention, Reynolds puzzle, puzzlingly asserts that she wants her novel to reach an audience who care about authenticity. Of course, both options can be true. There is nothing mutually exclusive, as her very writing proves, about telling a queer story while also paying exacting attention to historical detail. But her single-minded insistence on her readership's concern for the authentic, as opposed to any other value, such as a text queerness, a value that induced thousands of appreciative fans to write to her, reads as intentionally distancing. Reynolds chooses the authentic reader at the expense or the possibility of the queer. It's also worth noting that No Man Sings itself is a queer book, though written by a straight man under a pseudonym. Ironically, its jacket is one of the few of the period to embrace the queer sensibilities of its protagonist. Reynolds' aversion to the jacket might reflect her own complicated relationship to her sexual identity and her own views about sexual politics. As a result, uh, Reynolds suggested an image taken from a wine cup as the basis of the dust jacket design for her novel, The Last of the Wine. Guest agreed. Reynolds' control over the design, insisting on exact detail, led her to cover the novel in a way that visibly distanced her from the queerness of the narrative. As a short coda to this section, while Reynolds had considerable control over the first appearance of her works in hardback, she had less control over paperback editions. In contrast to Reynolds' insistence on the authentic, the 1960 Foursquare paperback edition embraces, even celebrates, a queer reading of the text. No doubt wildly inauthentic, the central image features a standing nude man in front of a seated figure, a stick selectively placed to preserve the standing man's modesty. The back cover depicts two nude men wrestling, and the brief blurb states clearly the nature of the relationship between the two protagonists. Athens, the war with Sparta, a time when love between men was considered higher and nobler than love between men and women. While these acts of distantiation using he and she images or turning to historical authenticity preserve the jacket while obscuring the text's queer understandings, for some queer texts, publishers instead felt forced into a more radical approach, no cover illustration at all. Typographical designs for dust jackets were, of course, a common feature of British dust jacket design and coexisted with illustrated jackets throughout the era. According to Charles Rosner, while the typographical dust jacket was most economical, it could also be most expressive of the character of the book, and certain publishing firms, notably Victor Gallant, relied on typographical dust jackets as a house brand, with other publishers such as Faber and Faber and Jonathan Cape also having well-defined typographical dust jacket traditions. But for some landmark queer texts, a typographical dust jacket design appears to have been chosen because of the difficulty, if not outright impossibility, of representing its very blatant homosexual theme on the cover. The tradition traces back at least as far as the Well of Loneliness, where its plain austere jacket was cited during its infamous trial as reason the book should not be declared obscene. Other landmark queer texts with typographical designs include Reynolds' 1944 lesbian and bisexual woman's novel, The Friendly Young Ladies, as well as James Courage's A Way of Love. Courage was particularly annoyed by this British jacket, especially in contrast to its American edition, which was much sexier and more alluring. Time limits me to one further example. 
This is Compton Mackenzie's Thin Ice, published by Chatto and Windus in 1956. Based loosely on the life of Baron George Lloyd, Thin Ice narrates the story of a British politician named Henry Fortescue, whose career seems destined for greatness. However, Fortescue is a homosexual man, and when his career ambitions are thwarted, he resorts to increasingly reckless behavior, eventually finding himself entangled in a blackmail scandal. Mackenzie's sympathetic treatment of the protagonist was universally lauded in the press, and Shadow and Windus produced an edition of 20,000 hardback copies. In 1959, Penguin followed with a paperback edition, making Thin Ice one of the most popular novels of the post-war era to center the concerns of a homosexual male protagonist. And yet, the jacket for Thin Ice is a typographical one. In the pre-publication correspondence in the Chatto archive, we find this letter dated the 14th of March, 1956 from Nora Smallwood, uh, the ed editor uh, at Chatto to Mackenzie. Ian and I have been talking about the jacket for Thin Ice, and we are both of the opinion that a designed one is too difficult and that it should be a typographical one. What do you feel? Three days later, Mackenzie replied, I quite agree that it would be much better without a colored picture jacket. The forthright queer content of the book made a colored picture jacket too difficult. The use of a typographical jacket is particularly striking in the context of the jackets for Mackenzie's other novels. His work had been associated with colorful cartoon-like jackets. In the post-war era, his novels Whiskey Galore, Hunting the Fairies, The Rival Monster, uh, Ben Nevis Goes East, and Rockets Galore featured bright, eye-catching designs. But Thin Ice, as a queer book, required a sober and restrained jacket. By the late 1960s, the necessity for acts of distantiation appear to have lessened with changes to obscenity law in the Sexual Offenses Act of 1967, which partially decriminalized homosexual acts between men in private. While the blurb for Francis King's A Domestic Animal makes a plea for its universal uh, homosexual themes, um, its cover could hardly be less ambiguous. For Iris Murdoch's A Fairly Honorable Defeat, highly praised in contemporary reviews for its realistic humanizing portrayal of homosexual couples Simon and Axel, John Surgent's cover illustration seems a hearkening back to an earlier era of heterosexualized images on queer texts. Here, a willowy nude woman runs wildly around a room, uh, a reference to the novel's most famous set piece. Yet the dust jacket design is a wraparound and the rear cover features an affectionate adult queer male couple. Two men, one older, one younger, hover their hands over a kuros, a statue of a Greek youth. The illustration depicts the meeting of Simon and Axel in an Athens museum, a record of the moment the two fall in love. The imagery is Greek, but instead of serving as a displacement for queerness, the image celebrates the romantic meeting of two queer characters. By reading the dust jackets across a genre, we gain insight into not only the genre, but also the dust jacket itself. The dust jacket is, an, is a marketing device, surely, but as with all marketing devices, we must be sensitive to the ways in which it can manipulate, as well as itself become the subject of manipulation. While the dust jacket can act as a bridge between text and audience, social and legal conditions mean that not all text can be so straightforwardly translated. The optimistic notion of the dust jacket designer conveying the spirit of the text to the eager book browser breaks down when we consider the dangers inherent in publicizing the mid-20th century queer text. Thank you.